For Stalin, establishing political control in Eastern Europe was a priority. All East European countries were to adopt the Stalinist model of government and to submit themselves to Soviet laws and rules of behavior. Uh, their leadership was to recognize Stalin as uh, uh, their supreme leader and their authority. In 1944-52, about half a million Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians were either executed or arrested or deported. About the same number of Ukrainians from Western Ukraine suffered the same fate. Uh, these countries had a small population, so for them these were very high numbers. Communist governments were established in all East European countries. How was it done? Uh, well, Political pressure. There was, of course, repression, which I have just mentioned. Uh, there were populist promises, often the outright deceit, sometimes electoral fraud, and in one case, an outright coup. Uh, so Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Bulgaria uh, had all communist governments soon after the war. But it was not all. Not every communist leader suited the role uh, which they had to play. The communist leadership had to be Bolshevized as the Soviet communist leadership was in the 1930s. So the selection among communist leaders continued. In this process, the presence of the Soviet troops uh, in Eastern Europe was a crucial factor. In 1948, Władysław Gomułka, uh, the Polish popular and ambitious leader, was accused of uh, right-wing deviations, expelled from the party and from the government, and uh, imprisoned. He survived. Soviet advisors uncovered an espionage organization in Hungary. It was purportedly led by the Minister of Internal Affairs, uh, Laszlo Reich. He was arrested and executed in 1949. In Bulgaria, Trichu Kostov, uh, the General Secretary of the Bulgarian Communist Party and uh, the Chairman of the Council of Ministers, was convicted and executed in 1949. Arrests of many other prominent communists, East European prominent communists, followed. Stalin initiated all these cases and he personally oversaw the purges. In one case, however, this policy did not work. Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia did not have Soviet troops. And uh, uh, its uh, leader, Joseph Broz Tito, who was head of the Yugoslavian guerrilla army during the war, insisted on Yugoslavia's independence and acted accordingly. He easily crushed the pro-Stalin opponents in his country. For Stalin, it was a blow. Uh, it was a dangerous precedent and the first crack in the Soviet bloc. Another blow was events in West Berlin. Of course, Stalin wanted to incorporate West Berlin completely in uh, the uh, Soviet sphere of interest. It was right in the middle of the Soviet sphere of interest, and yet it was controlled by the British, American, and the French. So Stalin perceived it as a security risk. What the Soviets did was to blockade West Berlin on the ground from all sides so that nothing could be delivered, no food, no water, nothing. It was an attempt to force West Berliners to accept Soviet rules uh, because they were invited to the Soviet sector 
to buy food and what, to get whatever they needed, but they refused. The Western Allies decided to help and uh, started Berlin Airlift when every day whatever was needed was brought by air, flight after flight. This is how it looked. Soviet aviation did not interfere despite the overwhelming capacity of the Soviet Air Force. Uh, Stalin was not ready for another war with uh, uh, the Western Allies. The blockade of West Berlin lasted from June 1948 until May 1949, for a year. And uh, the airlift made it senseless, so the Soviets stopped it. Uh, it was the final break up of the alliance and the first chapter of the developing Cold War. It also brought the Western allies closer together and uh, in April 1949 they established NATO, practically an anti-socialist, anti-Soviet alliance. But Stalin had some gains in the East. Soviet position was strengthened by the victory of communists in China. Stalin understood the importance of this potentially powerful ally. He kept contacts with Mao Zedong under his permanent and uh, personal control. He had direct communications with uh, uh, Mao Zedong and uh, Stalin's emissaries were very close to Mao and there were many of them. Mao received uh, Soviet assistance. Yet the first meeting between the two leaders happened only in December 1949, after Mao Zedong came to power. Uh, he came to Moscow in December 49 when Stalin was celebrating his 70th anniversary. This is the celebration. It was very pompous, and greetings came from all over the world. Mao's visit lasted two months. During it, a treaty of friendship, alliance, and mutual assistance between the Soviet Union and China were signed. Uh, it was signed not without prevarication and posturing. To begin with, uh, uh, Stalin made Mao wait for quite a long time until he could receive him. They somehow tried to weigh one another's power and to study one another, particularly Stalin studied Mao. He studied his reaction to this long wait and his reaction to the Soviets who were serving him but in the end, Stalin agreed to forfeit everything that he gained through the Sina soviet Treaty of 1945, excluding his influence in Mongolia. Getting China into the Soviet bloc was much more important. And here is uh, Stalin and Mao together. And by the way, pay attention to this picture again. Uh, Stalin's uh, 70th anniversary. Mao is right to the right of Stalin. This was the place of honor. Mao and Stalin, again, two leaders of the communist world. But Stalin understood the dangers of the alliance. Mao was a strong leader, and like Tito, he could decide one day that he could lead the communist world as well. Concessions had to be made to keep him on the leash. Stalin's heirs were to discover that these tactics worked only while Mao needed Soviet aid. After the Yalta conference, Churchill said, 
Stalin had a very good feeling with the two Western democracies and wants to work quite easily with us. My hopes lie in this single man. He will not embark on bad adventures. His prediction did not work out. Both sides found themselves disappointed. 